The following presentation is a production of Ride the Wave Media. Hello and welcome to this bonus material of Practically Magic. Today we are going to give you a little snippet of some story time. I am preparing to do some public events where I'm going to um, display some stories that I've prepared. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to record the story and have it available to those who are our Patreon or for bonus material on Ride the Wave Media. And today I've been asked to do a story about overcoming fears. And so when digging around for some mythology or perhaps some personal stories about overcoming fears, I came across this story which is a very old ancient story um, that is retold by a mythologist named Sandy Dunlop. Dunlop, and he is a mythographer, um, particularly specializing in stories that have been used and abused by power. And when I heard this story, I had to learn it and tell it, retell it in my own way. And so this is the story of the not chosen people. And I love that because I think I know what it feels like. I think most people who are listening to this story know what it feels like to be the not chosen people. You can imagine those moments you've had in your life where perhaps you were being chosen for a game. And of course, the fastest and the strongest are chosen as team captains. And they're going to choose who they feel are the next fastest and strongest to be a part of their team. And I think everyone knows what it feels like to be waiting for your name to be called, wondering if you're going to be fast enough or strong enough or talented enough or athletic enough to be chosen for the game. And if that has never happened to you, well, good for you. <laughs> For most of us, we know what that fear feels like. And this is the story of Sisar. In a few thousand years BC, maybe four or five thousand years BC, we have the story of Sisar. And Sisar, 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 she comes from a land at the beginning of civilization. It's in the northern end of Sudan, and it's where there is a trade network. There are pyramids. It is kind of the start of civilization in our world as, it, as we know it. And this is where her story starts. She goes from Sudan, where she travels up or down the Nile River to Egypt. And I can only imagine that when she spent time in Egypt, she probably heard a lot of the stories there. She probably heard the mythology of the story of Isis, the goddess who is the goddess of healing, whose husband Osiris is torn apart into 14 different pieces by his brother. And Isis, being the healing goddess, tries to put all of his parts back together and heal him and make him whole again, which she is successful at all except for one part. And those of you who know the mythology of Isis know what that one part was. She was not able to successfully reattach to her husband's body. But even so, she figures out a way to still create worlds and to give birth to her son. And I imagine Cesar, as she was there being fostered in her youth, she probably heard those stories and got comfortable with what those stories were and how they influenced the people of Egypt. It is at this point in time that a priest tells her a prophecy that at some point in her life, she will go and inhabit a land never before touched by humans. And she takes this journey from Egypt and she goes to Babylon. And in Babylon, she hears the story of Tiamat, the goddess who had her children destroyed and therefore becomes the angry woman goddess who is out for revenge. She gives birth to monsters and she's ready to kind of destroy. And then this, we have 
the beginning of the strong man mythology here because Marduk, who is a strong man, he is the one who shoots an arrow and kills Tiamat and dismembers her body into two pieces, which become the earth and the heavens. And isn't it interesting? Cesar probably compared these stories of the dismembered god in Egypt and the dismembered goddess in Babylon. And from here, her journey takes her to the Hebrew tribes. And it is at this point in the story that we learn that Sisera is actually the granddaughter of Noah. She is the daughter of Bith, who is Noah's son, and her brother is Larda. And by the time she gets to the Hebrew tribes, she hears, learns of another mythology story, which is of the god Yahweh. And her grandfather has been appointed by Yahweh to build an ark and has prophesied that there will be rains and there will be floods because there are groups of people that have angered Yahweh and Yahweh is a vengeful God. And Noah is the strong hero who is going to be able to recognize and a discern who is worthy of joining the ark and who is not. And unfortunately for Cesar, at this point in her journey, in this point in her long travels, in all of her knowledge and wisdom, she has come to her grandfather and he tells her she is not worthy to join him on the ark. She's not chosen. She has been consorting with thieves and vagabonds, and therefore he's going to choose the animals and he's going to choose the family members that are going to join him on the ark. Now, this is a pivotal moment in Cesar's story because this is a point where this means certain death. It is painful and it is usually means death when someone is rejected from their own family. But we know from this great amount of chaos and fear when something like this happens in our lives, that human beings are tend to respond in fight, flight, or freeze, or perhaps fawn. And Cesar could have resorted to any of those techniques. Maybe in fawning, she could have said, Grandfather, Noah, please allow me to be on your boat. I will do anything. I will submit to your authority. I will submit to you if I can just be allowed on the ark. Now, to her credit, Cesar does not do this. Even in such a time of great fear, she decides instead to get creative. And what she does instead is she builds her own, not one but three arcs. And instead of gathering animals to fill this ark, note she instead gathers her 50 besties, her 50 best friends, 50 women who each are um, skilled in some way that will be helpful to them. And these arcs are going to be populated by 50 women and three men. And these three men are her father, her brother, and her chosen mate, her lover, Fenton. And they take their three arcs and they continue their journey. And it is on this part of the journey that they are, um, they come into contact with the Greeks and in learning about some of the Greek mythology, and I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with Greek mythology. It's something that we're taught in elementary school most of the time. And so she recognizes something very interesting about the Greeks, and that is that they don't just have Greek mythology and stories, but they have philosophers as well. And what's interesting about the philosophers is that they hate mythology. They hate it. And why do they hate it? Not because it's not powerful, but because it is powerful. Mythology has such a power over the people. And Cesar, in all of her travels, would have noted this. And she continues on and she sees and she meets with the Celts. And she notices that the Celts have great stories about kingship 
and anointing kings by sovereignty goddesses. And the Celts have such a deep connection with the land. And then she would have continued traveling on. And this is where she gets to the land that has never before set foot by humans. And she lands the arcs. Unfortunately, two of them are destroyed. And so she lands the ark on Dunenbach, the land of Ireland. And this is as close to a creation story as we have for I Ireland. So she lands there 40 days before the flood. But now she has a blank canvas for which to create her own mythology. It is Marshall McLuhan that said something along the lines of, and I am summarizing or paraphrasing, he says, the one thing in which the fish knows about nothing about, it's water. And he's talking about culture. Water is culture. So here is a journey that Cesar has been on that makes the Odysseus journey, the Odyssey, look like a trip around the duck pond. Because she has witnessed and collected stories her entire life on this vast journey, seeing so many parts of the world and so many cultures. And that is how she's able to know her own culture, her own story. So she arrives in Dunenbach and she is going to create her own mythology, her own story. Unfortunately, tragedy strikes again when her lover Fenton tasked with being one of the fathers of the next generation and being uh, pressured into it and wanting to avoid uh, those pressures, he abandons her. He is a shapeshifter in this story. And so he shapeshifts into a salmon and he swims away as the waters begin to rise. And now she's heartbroken. She has no way to carry on her descendants. But even as the waters rise, she is not fearful because she knows that even if she is not going to pass on her lineage, she is going to pass on her story, her mythology. And after the experiences and wisdom that she's had over everything she's been through, she knows that that is a legacy. And to make up for his mm, abandonment, Fenton actually turns from a salmon into a hawk. And he ends up living another 5,000 years, spreading her story around the world to make up for his great sin. And this is how, when the waters rise and she is overcome, She knows that her legacy will be the story of the not chosen people. In a world of chaos, in a world of fear, do we look to the strong man, the Yahweh, the Noah, or the Morduk of the story? Or do we look in the face of creative energy itself? I, for one, will be proud to be one of the not chosen people like Cesar. And that is my story today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you would like to see more from me, you can find me on Instagram at prism underscore healing or on TikTok at prism healing, where I share more of what I have to offer. Thank you and have a great day.